We welcome back Senator Bruce Tarr, the uh, Senate Minority Leader in the state of Massachusetts. And Senator, um, the sun is out as we record this. We're heading towards spring. It's about a week away. The clocks are going to be changing this weekend. And uh, in my mind, optimism is, is really bubbling to the surface. How are you doing, sir? Well, I think there's good reason for optimism, Rick. Uh, the thing that we've all been carrying around so heavily weighting our shoulders for the last year with regard to the pandemic uh, is something that we're seeing positive signs about. And of course, we just commemorated or marked uh, really the one year uh, since the declaration of the public health emergency that we've been living under. Uh, but we're seeing a lot of positive signs. And uh, Rick, one of the most positive actually comes from the remarks uh, by our president last night uh, that we can expect to get a lot more vaccine. It's something that you and I have talked about. Uh, we have tremendous capability in Massachusetts to vaccinate more people, but we have not been getting nearly what we need to be able to do that. And uh, the president last night was very encouraging in his remarks in terms of how we will be seeing more and increased production and more collaboration between producers of that vaccine. So that is probably the best news that I've heard on this front in a while. But also very good news is that Massachusetts is revamping and has revamped and redeployed our registration system to get a vaccine, to get an appointment. Uh, we all know there's been a lot of frustration with that. And part of that frustration is because there hasn't been enough vaccine. So there haven't been enough appointments. So people have had to wait for very long periods of time to be able to book one. And in some cases have spent hours and not been able to get one. So the good news is that um, we are moving toward and there has been deployed uh, a new system. And I wanna make sure that I give the uh, website right, uh, but it's uh, vaccine sign up dot mass dot gov and that will now incorporate a pre-registration system where folks will be able to provide their information and they'll be called when a vaccine appointment is available and they'll have 24 hours to decide whether or not to accept that appointment and uh, rick pre-registration does require some information and again i'm reading which i don't usually do but i want to make sure i get it right and so uh, the required information is obviously your name address your date of birth, the contact information where you'd like to be contacted, and the preferred method of communication, whether that be email, text, or a phone call. And uh, the option uh, will be given to ask for help scheduling over the phone, because we know that all of us aren't as computer proficient as some, and so that is important. And uh, there'll also be information about eligibility on that site. So two things here the increase in the amount of vaccine that we can expect and the uh, improvement that we hope dramatic improvement of the registration system for appointments, uh, those things give us reason to be optimistic. Senator, you have been a major proponent of uh, actually pleading uh, with the federal government to get get us more stuff, get, get more vaccine here in Massachusetts. So I know that uh, uh, in Gloucester, which is one of your constituency, constituencies, uh, the, the mayor in Gloucester has said the same thing. We got it, we're all set here. We got it ready to go. We've got this place and that place and so on, and we can get the logistics out here. Uh, just give us more vaccine. That said, Senator, um, uh, it, it just seems to me as, as I, I guess sort of as a casual observer, um, but also a, a person of, of, of logic, you know, as a math teacher in science, I think the rollout has been incredibly good. You're talking in Massachusetts alone, I don't know how many tens of millions of people there are, but we've got more than 10, 15% already vaccinated. And this thing just started a few weeks ago. And I know people are saying, well, yeah, it's important because of, of, of the um, of the mortality rate and so on. But all in all, Senator, um, I, I just, my opinion is that if people could just be a little more patient, I think this thing is rolling along well. And plus what you just mentioned, the the digital component coming from the state in particular of being able to register has gotten better and better and better each week. Well, you're right, Rick. And obviously we're dealing with large volumes of people and we'd all like to have the vaccine as soon as we can possibly get it. So I understand uh, why people uh, feel a certain amount of anxiety about being able to get it right away. And in fact, our office has fielded a lot of calls about that 
And we understand frustration people have had, but we continue to direct folks to the various places where they can go to get a vaccine. Uh, there are local clinics, for instance, that have had their own local website portal where folks can go to register. In fact, there are second doses being injected as we speak uh, right now in Gloucester uh, at the Cruiseport facility uh, by, by a local pharmacist, Alex Doyle, who's been running a lot of these local clinics. So I understand that there's frustration, but I also understand your point, and I think it's an important one, is that our percentage of people vaccinated based on what we've been getting for a vaccine is very high and very significant when you compare it to other states. Um, so I think we've made tremendous progress. And again, I understand you don't, may not feel that way if you've been on the computer for six hours trying to get an appointment, but I think if you look at the big picture, you'll see that we are making good progress. And also, Rick, I think it's important to remember that for every person that gets vaccinated, we move closer to herd immunity, which is the goal, which is to make sure that the virus can't transmit because we've all either developed an immunity or have been inoculated against it. So we are making progress. But again, I do sympathize with folks that have had a hard time getting an appointment. I know it's difficult, but things are moving in the right direction, in my opinion. Yes, yes. And it's going to be fun to, at some point, look back on this, put things in perspective and uh, you know, maybe have a little critique and, and see where we are and so on. But there are other things going on, Senator. Uh, the state still has to do its business. Uh, people still have to, uh, you know, get up and go to work every day. Um, and that leads me to a couple of questions, I guess. Next is, uh, what's the status of, of, of the budget? Because um, uh, with the, what, what happened last night with, with the, the Democrats in Washington signing a bill and so on, how does that affect the state, if at all? Well, the bill that got signed uh, last night, to, to use a term, Rick, is actually a game changer for us in Massachusetts. Um, it includes a lot of money for the states, uh, which is something that we've been hoping for for several months. And uh, I just received the most recent estimate uh, that we were able to get from the House Oversight and Reform Committee. The, that's a federal committee. And we stand, uh, based on their current estimate, uh, to receive about $8.1 billion in various ways coming into Massachusetts. And it comes at a critical time because we are in fact putting together the House and Senate versions of the budget. Uh, the governor has already presented his, we've talked about that. The House will be debating the budget and passing a budget if all goes according to plan in April. The Senate will do its version of the budget in May and having this information and more importantly, having these dollars available to us in a way that we can plan for is extremely significant. And so now uh, we have been planning a budget that was balanced and responsible without these funds. Now that we can anticipate them, it becomes a different exercise. We obviously don't wanna spend carelessly because we'll have access to these funds. We need to be responsible, but it gives us the flexibility that we otherwise wouldn't have had. Again, optimism to me sounds optimistic. Uh, Senator, a couple of quick things here in our pregame warm-up. You talked about the we, we talked last week about the payroll protection plan and um, a little. Uh, the, you know, I, I was just telling you that I was watching a, a hockey game in Siberia <laughs> as as um, uh, the Russian uh, former Russian uh, hockey athletes pros are are, uh, are trying to raise awareness about climate change in Siberia. Is this in any way all connected? Well, climate change is connected to all of us. And, and that's an important thing. And I, I recall saying to you uh, before we came on the air, you know, I hope that uh, the, those in Russia that, that are involved in that hockey game and those that represent them in government are willing to do their fair share because we all need to. And we certainly need to in Massachusetts. And we've got a climate bill uh, that has been moving through the legislative process in the last session. It's carried over into this session. And uh, Rick, that came before the Senate yesterday, but the version uh, that we were asked to take action on was provided to us at roughly 10.30 the night before. And I took exception to that, and I laid the bill on the table, which is a, an option that every senator has. And I made it clear that I've been supportive of bills of this nature in the past, but I wanted time to read what was in the bill. And so the matter now is laid on the table, which means it can't come up uh, until the earliest on Monday. And I've been using that time to read the changes in the bill, to talk to folks about it. And I think that's my responsibility as a legislator 
And so others have had that opportunity now too, and I'm glad we've had that chance. And so we do have a climate bill that's very, very extensive and will have very, uh, it will have a number of impacts and it has some risk as well. And so we're looking at that and trying to decide how to next act. Along with that, uh, the payroll protection plan uh, that you mentioned, uh, those were loans that were given by the federal government, many of them converted to grants. And so the grants would otherwise be taxable by the state of Massachusetts. They are not taxable by the federal government. And having not to pay that tax is really significant if you're a small business and you're really struggling to emerge from the pandemic and survive. And so it's important that we take action as soon as possible. And fortunately, there is a bill uh, that's been proposed by the Speaker of the House and the Senate President that not only takes action on that matter, but also looks at unemployment insurance, because if we do nothing, the rate of unemployment insurance for the average employer, for their average employee, is going to go from the 500s to the 800s. And so what the governor has proposed is using the borrowing power of the state government to borrow the funds we need to keep the unemployment and trust fund whole and pass those savings on to the employers. Those two things are in a bill that also provides benefits to employees. So for instance, if they have to take time off to get an injection, uh, it provides the ability to do that. And interestingly enough, those benefits are targeted to come from the new federal money that we hope we're gonna get. And so these are two very important bills. Uh, my argument has been, we should act on the second one immediately because tax returns are due on the 15th for businesses. Um, climate change is important, but so is saving small businesses. So we're going to sort this out next week. Um, the House actually passed the payroll protection plan unemployment insurance bill. And so now we're going to get that. So hopefully by the next time we talk, Rick, um, we will have good news on a climate change bill and good news on a, a small business and employee bill, and both of which are important. Well, as a friend of mine, Senator, I, I, uh, I wish you could spend about six months on Maui to recuperate from all this stuff, and I mean that sincerely. Um, but uh, one final thought is that uh, Governor Baker got a little testy this week. I think it was on Wednesday, uh, uh, talking about um, you know teachers, uh, the teachers union, I guess it was, pushing for certain things. Um, and, and I know a lot of people, as you mentioned earlier, are anxious, but Senator, what, what's your message to your constituents, to me and to others, in terms of how things are going? Because it, as I said before, I think we're headed in the right direction and people, if we just can, can stay patient and stay diligent, I think we're gonna be fine. But I want you to talk to, to us. I, I totally agree with that, Rick. But again, I think it's important to look back over the past year you know, our lives have been changed in so many ways. Um, we've had to, uh, I think, think about people that are essential in our lives that maybe we didn't quite think of that way in the past, like the people that work in our grocery stores and drive the trucks that deliver those groceries. I think we have a renewed appreciation for our first responders and our doctors and our nurses who have been charting uncharted territory to be able to respond to us. And Rick, I think we also have to remember that this pandemic has not just been about statistics. It's been about the loss of people we love and our family and our friends and our neighbors. And I was able to participate in a tremendous um, service at Cape Ann Museum uh, a couple of nights ago, which is really important. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that as human beings, one of the most important things this pandemic has exposed is that we have vulnerabilities but we also have interdependence. And while we've been separated from each other and isolated more than I would have liked, the pandemic has also reminded us that when we stand up for each other and we work with each other, we have an incredible amount of strength. And when it comes to the pandemic, we took something that came to us. We used to read news stories about it, that this was happening far away. Yeah. And then almost overnight, it was in our community and we had to deal with it and people have, and a vaccine was developed in record time. It's being administered at a very high rate of efficiency. Obviously there have been problems. This is an unprecedented situation, but I think we have, we have a lot to think about. We have a lot of lessons to learn 
And we also have a lot to really, um, I think, uh, remember as we go forward, because when we deal with a traumatic experience, sometimes over time, we forget some of the lessons that we might learn. And I think, Rick, it's also important when we talk about um, teachers um, that there have been four dates set aside uh, for teacher vaccination. Uh, again, Saturday, March 27th, Saturday, April 3rd, Saturday, April 10th, and Sunday, April 11th. And so like many other things, when a contingency has arisen, we found a way to respond to it. And it's not perfect. And it's not something maybe that would have looked the same if we had time to plan for it. But it has called on all of us to do what we can. And you know, there's an old saying, and I think it emanated, I'm not sure it's attributed to Winston Churchill, but I think it is uh, from World War II, uh, that it's not up to us to only do our best. We must do that which is required of us. And we all have a ways to go. And that which is required of us includes patience, but it also includes appreciation for the things people have done for us and the way that we've gotten to where we are.